Today, our speaker in chapel is Michael Easley. He's the president and host of Michael Easley in Context in College Grove, Tennessee. I first met Michael 40 years ago and uh, have followed his career, and I am thrilled that he is here today. And you will, it won't take you five minutes, and you'll say, wow, I'm glad I came to chapel, and I need to get to know this guy. For over 40 years, he has served churches in Texas, Northern Virginia, and the Washington, D.C. area, and in Nashville. He also served as the eighth president of the Moody Bible Institute. After completing a Bachelor of Science in Education in 1980 from Stephen F. Austin State University, he earned a THM and a DMIN from Dallas Theological Seminary. In recognition of his doctoral work, Michael received the John G. Mitchell Award for Outstanding Scholarship and Effectiveness in Ministry. He is the host of two podcasts, Michael Easley in Context and Ask Dr. E. Michael and Cindy, and by the way, Cindy is here. And Cindy, if I could just appropriately embarrass you, would you mind raising your hand and let us welcome you for being in chapel today? Thank you so much. Michael and Cindy have four adult children, four grandchildren, and they make their home in College Grove, Tennessee. Additionally, they love excellent Mexican food. Would you join me today in welcoming Michael Easley to our pulpit here in chapel? Well, good morning. It's an honor to be here, a privilege to be here. This place changed my life. The four years we spent on the THM degree left an impress that's still there. I pray the same for you. We had a remarkable time. It was brutal, sometimes fun. Sometimes I was in trouble. I went through most of my classes with two peer, and uh, Dr. Hendricks dubbed us the unholy trinity. <laughs> but it was Prof and Dr. John Hanna, and Bill Lawrence, Alan Ross. I could go on, but they left a mark. And when I opened this Bible, I don't just think of Greek and Hebrew that I still work with. I don't just think of understanding what is this saying and what are you doing to these poor people when you tell them God says. But I have this sort of weird, you know, over my shoulder, Dr. Ross looking at my Hebrew, Dr. Hannah looking at my theology, Dr. Lawrence looking at how are you communicating to these poor people? And they changed my life. Thanks. Thanks. I don't know if you're in the room, but thank you for those of you who are. Um, it's humbling to be here. I've spoken at huge groups and small groups, and this is the most terrifying pulpit in the country. <laughs> Father, your word is true. We need to align ourselves to it again and again. It is without error. It is available, it's accessible, and these men and women of all people need to be the most devoted to understanding it, to communicating it, and sharing it. Encourage them, whether they're about done with their coursework or watching online or however you're using them, that this is serious business because we stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. As always, overcome the limitations of men and women and use us in spite of us, we pray in Christ's name, amen. I want to share with you some things I have learned and continue to relearn. I've not mastered these, and I'll tell you up front, none of this is new. You'll see these and go, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that, and that's fine, but that's part of education. Um, I'm a co-struggler. I'm a sinner to the core, and I continue to work at how do I love Christ more than myself? How do I serve Christ? How do I share Christ? Every one of us has thousand distractions throughout the day and if you're using technology the dopamine hits are exasperating your ability to think clearly and to relate clearly 
So these are just some things I have learned. You know all these, but maybe some will encourage you. Number one, live for Christ, not for self. We're in an I, me, my culture. Everything is focused on I, me, my. Even the labeling of an iPhone. I mean, it's so pretentious. It's all about me. Steve Jobs was a prophet. I want the computer to be your personal friend. And that was the result and is the result. The problem is to live for Christ is to die to self. And it's hard. Galatians 2.20. I memorized this verse my sophomore year in college. Why don't you say it with me? I have been crucified with Christ. I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Um, I call this cooperative sanctification. I can still remember reading it, and it jumped off the page to me in my little college rent house in Nacogdoches, Texas. And I went, that's it! That's it! I'm crucified! I don't live in the flesh, but I do! And I've got this tension. But I have to remind myself every morning. I have this little routine. I do most every morning when I wake up, I have a bad back, so I have to use body mechanics to get out of bed, and I throw my feet over, and I gingerly put my weight on both legs, and I go, am I going to serve my Savior or myself? I say it almost every morning. Am I going to serve my Savior or myself? A lot of days I serve myself. A lot of days it's about me. It's about I, me, my. And I suspect it may be true for you. But that he loved me and he died for me, we know it too well. We know these things. They're common. They're cliche. I suspect many of you memorized Galatians 2.20 at some point in your Christian life. It's one of those verses that sort of cuts across our heart. But the tension that we have that I'm going to die to self and live for Christ. And we often, Cindy and I taught marriage conferences for 15 years. And we had this little thing we would do. And we'd say, you know, marriage isn't hard. It's impossible. And the same is true with the Christian life. Dying to self isn't hard. It's impossible. But that's our call. That's Paul's instruction to you and me. It's worth knowing, and it's worth coming back to. Secondly, live, for, live with a purpose. Now, purposes change over time. When I started out, when we were, Cindy and I were early married, and here at Dallas, we had certain ideas, hopes, prayers, and purposes. I like to think in decades, your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. It's a good way to think, because in the middle of it, when you start your 20s, it's, that's a long time plan, 30, but all of a sudden you're in stride, and the finish line's there. If most of you are married and start to have kids, your 30s and 40s, you're pretty much chained in a good way to being a person of family. You're raising your kids. Your focus is on training and soccer and rehearsals and practice and homework. And it's, you're locked into a system. By your 50s, your highest earning years, you are probably in a ditch. You're in a rut. Not necessarily bad, but it's very difficult to get out and make a major change. Because your family, your finances, practicality of life, you're pretty well in this pattern for the next 10 years. And then when that big 6-0 comes up, it terrifies you. And you go, 60? Wow, those are old people. My dad in his 80s would say, I'd say, he was old. He goes, how old was he? Oh, he's like 65. Dad would say, oh, he's a young fella. It's all relative. It's all perspective. And then in your 60s, you start getting this second wind like, I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore. <laughs> I don't. I'm 67 and proud of it. I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore because I don't answer to anybody. I've lived long enough, hopefully by faith, I answer to one. He's the one with whom I should be concerned, my purpose God's plan for you is immeasurably better than any vision you come up with. God's plan for you is better than any ministry you create. God's plan for you is any job or role you ever take. But you have to peel it back and say, this is not I, me, my, first point. How do I serve Christ? The number of people I've talked to that have a vision or a plan or a ministry, they're going to start some new Dig wells, God help you. 
There are so many people digging wells, and you know what? They all fall apart about 18 months later. How about someone to go over there and maintain all those visions? How about someone to go over there and live and work among people and really help an indigenous group know Christ? Visions are great. Don't hear me negate them totally. But my word, ask yourself, is this about me and my idea? Or am I serving Christ? What's my purpose, Lord? When I was at Moody, I've had a number of back surgeries when I resigned to Moody because of the back issues I have. And um, Cindy and I had about six or nine months where I was rehabbing from surgery. We would take a walk every morning in this area of uh, the west suburbs. And we pretended we had a white marker board in front of us. And as we walked, we'd say, I could go back to being a pastor. I could go do this. I could go do that. Sure. Um, but we prayed as we walked, Lord, the white marker board is blank. What do you want us to do? What, who do you want us to be? And I'm not going to give you any like revelational insight we got out of it, but the exercise was critical. What am I going to do? Now, please hear me. Some people have incredible visions. Ahmad Yashadi is doing an incredible work in Jordan. There are your friends and graduates doing incredible work around the globe. Don't hear me wrong, but just open-handedly say, Lord, what's your purpose? You'll be a lot happier, a lot healthier if you're making disciples and sharing Christ than chasing some dream or chasing some ministry that may or not come to work. In the Nashville area, it's almost a cliche how many ministries there are with the word hope or grace in them. It's like everybody moved there and they said, we're going to be hope force, hope international, hope grace force all over the town. Little pockets of 501c3s. Great. But I have to ask myself, are any of them making disciples? Are any of them sharing Christ with people? Are any of them putting the shoulder to the wheel? I call this Paul's great commission. It's been a very important verse to me. Colossians 1, 28, 29. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. Why? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I also I labor and strive, agonizomai, according to his power which works mightily within me. You know, you're, you're going to help people live or die because of this word. You're going to help them live or die because of this word. If Dallas Seminary doesn't teach the Bible and encourage you guys to teach scripture and make disciples, I don't know what they're doing. Remember I said a minute ago, I don't care what people think about me anymore. It just comes down to basic stuff. Third, seek good and godly counsel. You know all these passages, Proverbs 11, 4, in the abundance of counselors as there's victory and so forth and so on. I have a group of friends that the oldest friend I, friendship I have is 57 years of age. We met in third grade and we've been friends most of that time. We both came to Christ out of the Catholic Church about the same time. We have followed each other's lives and our family stories and our adoptions and our children getting married and so forth and so on. And I could pick up the phone and call George and we would be right back where we left off a week ago, a month ago, six months ago. I've got a handful of friends that are closer than brothers. I wouldn't do anything without them. I don't make a decision without talking to them. I learned early on in my Christian life I needed stronger, more mature men to help me. And so I unapologetically chased other men. When I was in college, I chased the pastor of this little Bible church I attended. And he patiently explained eternal security. He patiently explained why I should be baptized. He patiently explained things from the Bible, just page by page. And no small reason that little church and other Dallas-influenced people brought me to this place. And I look back on it with great, great gratitude to God and these men. There were pastors, there were contractors, there was a physician, there was a banker who discipled me. We read Knowing God together back in the mid-70s, and met once a week. He was a little short guy in a suit, and I had a mechanics uniform on. We were Mutt and Jeff. It was a riot. And he'd open Knowing God, and he'd ask me questions, and we talked about it. When we came here during seminary, I chased the aforementioned professors, somewhat to nagging them. And it was a privilege to spend time with all the men I mentioned over lunch and coffee. And I would just say as a sidebar, 
You men and women now, you need to pursue your professors when you're out of here. Make it a point. You buy them lunch. You buy them a coffee. You set up a schedule occasionally. And we lived in Grand Prairie for almost 10 years after we finished. And I came over frequently and saw these professors and took them to the Baylor cafeteria and bought them a cup of coffee and had Mexican food and asked the real questions I didn't ask in seminary. When we moved to Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, I was overmatched. We went from a midside church in Texas to a mega church in Northern Virginia. In Northern Virginia, it's Washington, D.C. It's the power capital of the world. And the men and women there are all at the top of their game. More military, more PhDs, more attorneys than anywhere on the planet. And they were in the church where I served. Talk about a quantum change from Grand Prairie, Texas. <laughs> and I learned pursue smarter, more capable men and understand the culture. And we had an incredible 12 years there. If you are making your own decisions, good for you. Maybe I'm just weak. I needed good, godly people around me to help me make big decisions. Obviously, if Cindy wasn't in on it, it was a showstopper. But if she was in on it, we still want to counsel those who'd been there, done that, every step of the way. In the front of my Bible, I have a list of 30 things that would happen if I lost my integrity. I wrote this when I was in seminary, and I improved it over the years, and things like I would have lied sinned, offended God, I would wreck my marriage, I would lose all ability to minister, I would butcher my credibility with, I name the churches I've served, I'd ruin my alumni relationship with Dallas Seminary. That's on there. 30 of them. And I would read that occasionally, because in the same vein, over my lifetime, I have 39 men in the back of my Bible who messed up. I know them. I stopped recording the names at 39. I said, why are you doing this easily? And I read each one and I go, that could be me on that list. And the reason I do that illustratively is the front of my Bible is life and the back of my Bible is death. Now I know Christ forgives and I know some of these guys are maybe going to find their way. Some of them are damaged goods. I'm not any better, nor are you. And part of this for me was I had to surround myself with men who were strong, committed believers who could help me along the way, not be an idiot. I tell the story too often, but one of my friends named Dave Gibson, he's also a graduate of Dallas, a little bit ahead of me. And we become very close friends in 1984 and remain so. And Dave has a way of saying things. And he would say, Michael, I don't know if you need a dope slap or a dose of encouragement right now. But Dave would get on a plane tomorrow and fly to Nashville if I said, buddy, I need you. And vice versa. And we've both been through thick and thin with families, with ministries, with churches, with money, with health. And we talk all the time on the phone. Seth Hewitt's sitting over here. Robert White's sitting over here. They've gone through hell and back. And they know my stuff and I know theirs. And I love them. You got to have a close group of people. And it may not be in your ministry sphere. That was hard for me to understand. It may not be if you're in a local church, it may not be those people. You might have to work outside. Here's the bottom line I tell this story, and people come up and say, I wish I had friends like that. And I, I feel like Howard Hendricks would say, No, you don't, because you don't know what it takes. You've got to pursue people and pursue them and pursue them. And you know, a lot of them won't work out, and that's okay. You married couples know this better than anyone. Trying to find a couple where all four of you get along, next to impossible, right? Next to impossible. I really like him. Are you kidding me? The jury's out on that dude. And so Sydney and I have had our dance over the years. And when you find that couple, you hang on to them. And you pursue them and forget the tit for tat. Be a believer. Be a mature person. Chase them. Love them. Fourth, my sin my sins have a greater impact on me than I want to acknowledge. And Christ's forgiveness has greater effect than I will ever understand. Um, when I was in college, a group of us memorized Romans 6, the chapter. And um, it was, I don't know why we did it. 
but we did it. And it was convicting, and it was encouraging, and it was, it was difficult. And we used the three by five cards. We had no technology in those days. And um, he who has died is freed from sin. He who has died is freed from sin. Do you feel free from sin? Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin. Okay, I got to reckon it. I gotta, I'm dead to that sin, Michael. I don't have to be tempted and act upon that. Sin will not be master over you. And it just, it pounded me and pounded me and pounded me. I learned somewhere along that time, I needed grace because I sinned from the very beginning, if you will, but I need mercy because I sin every day. First church I served, I was, I don't work at being transparent. I don't work at being authentic. I just figure you're going to lie or tell the truth. That's how I look at it. And I can't talk about a marriage and lie about what Sydney and I do or don't do. So I was always, I just felt like it is. And when we were, I can't remember what sermon it was, obviously. You never remember any sermons you preach, bless God. (laughs) But I was very animated about this. We sin every day, we sin every day. And I was walking on the edge of the platform. I said, you know, I sin every day. In my mind, in my thought life, my attitudes, my critical spirit, I sin all the time. I'm not talking about actionable sins. That's a different thing. And we do that too, right? And this woman came down afterwards with her hands on her hips. and She goes, I don't like my pastor saying I sin every day. And she was fit for a fight. And I said, well, I sin every day. And she didn't laugh. I thought it was pretty funny. Dangerous to live on the knife edge of sin. I don't know about you. I don't know you all. I know where we're, we are in Middle Tennessee. The younger men and women live what I call on the knife edge of sin. They live on the edge. They live so close to sinning in their lifestyle because they know they can get forgiveness. They know grace is immeasurable. And they, with their sexuality, with their identity, with their language, with their activities, they live on the edge. And I don't want to be a prude or, you know, way of liberty in Jesus to do these things. That, you stand before Christ on how you and I live. I don't stand before you, and fortunately you don't stand before me. But how do I love a world that crucified him? How do I love the things of the world that drove him to Calvary? I don't know. Five. Maturity is when you stop blaming your past, own your present, and plan your future. Stop blaming your past, own your present, plan your future. I I learned this too late in life. And it dawned on me because in these decades of my life, you meet with kind of, hear me carefully, I don't want to be unkind, but a category of people that are stuck in victimhood or they're stuck in the way they were parented. I'm not minimizing the hurt. Please don't run off the edge of what I'm saying here. I'm not minimizing you can be a victim and it leaves deep, deep scars. Don't hear me say that. What I will say without apology is that define you for the rest of your life? We have dear family friends that are in Northern Virginia. The father had two liver transplants. His daughter had two liver transplants. I've never known any family that's been on the cusp of life and death as many times over 20 plus years. And in God's kindness, they're doing well now. And the daughter who had two liver transplants just got married two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., I met her when she was four years old, and I got to officiate her wedding. I interviewed her once sometime back on the podcast. Her name's Ashley. I said, Ashley, how do you do do this? Michael, everybody has hard. Mic drop. Everybody has hard. Your heart might be harder than mine. Mine might be harder than yours. It doesn't matter. Comparison of pain and suffering is not a competition. Just because someone has it worse than you doesn't make me feel any better. When I meet someone who's got worse back issues than me, it doesn't make me feel better. It's not a competition or a comparison. Everybody has hard. Will I be identified by that? Will you be identified by that? I've met adults in their 50s and 60s that are still stuck in the scars and the hurts of the victimization they experienced. I'm not minimizing it. But I would argue you never get any further than that. If you're defined as the person who someone hurt, some injustice occurred, 
part of the Christian life, is it not, is growing in Christ. And for me to mature, for me to grow, it's not fair. I know it's not fair. Um, no one can make you grow. No one. Every pastor I know gets beat up at some point in his life. And I'm talking about men pastors because that's been most of my world. Sorry. But that's been most of my world. And I have a lot of pastor friends and they get beat up. Um, I heard a guy say years ago at some conference that the average pastor leaves his church over six or seven people. I can believe it. Because there's six or seven that drove me nuts everywhere I was. God's way of keeping you humble and keeping you dependent on him, not your abilities that you think are important. And part of maturity was, i got to own my present here. i got to own my condition. This is where I, I am serving God, I hope. Now, how do I manage that? But here's the cool part. When you can let go of the past, when you can own your present, you can start prayerfully planning the future. Okay, Lord, what does that purpose look like in this next decade? What does that thing look like in the next chapter? I'm sad to report I know a lot of bitter Christians. And I don't know if you're there, and maybe you're not. But I'll tell you, Christ loves you. He died for you. Doesn't want you to stay there. Six, be a lifelong student of God's word. If you've been around the seminary, Lewis Perry Chafer said it in a similar way. Study for a lifetime. It took me a while to understand what that meant. I often say, get your nose in the book. It's so pedantic for a seminary audience to be told, do you read your Bible every morning? I got to write an exegetical paper. I got to write a philosophy of ministry paper. I got to do my credits. I got to study for this Greek or Hebrew exam. No, have you read your Bible today? I was a first year THM student. Dr. Louis Barbieri was, we had advisors in those days, and you had to go see your advisor at the end of each semester. I'm sitting in Dr. Barbieri's office. And the first thing he says, Michael, do you read your Bible? Well, you're kind of meddling right out of the chute, aren't you? And of all things, he had an NIV in his lap. That ain't even a Bible in my world, but he had an NIV in his lap. And he said, yeah, you just read it. Just read it. And he read something to me. What do we learn about God from that? You talk about a dope slap. Bob Salstrom in those days was what they called alumni and church relations director. Greg might know him, Greg Hatterberg. Bob had a little office in the back building with a round table. Got to know Bob, and the reason I got to know Bob, there was a free coffee pot up there in those days. He always offered me coffee, sure. And I would go in there, and you know what he had on this round table? A Bible open. Michael, have you read your Bible this morning? So now, and he put his hand on my, let's read it. And it just Melted away. Do you read the scripture every morning? You're at Dallas Seminary. I have a bunch of surgeon friends. When I have surgery, I want to know if someone had a fellowship in surgery. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that they did their residency. And so I want to know, did you do a fellowship in what you're about to do to me? Because those are the people I'm going to let cut on my neck or my back. You know, technology is wonderful. I love technology. But I think there's something neuroplastic. Talk to Dr. Dyer about this. About having a Bible and a pen and a pad. And keeping the tech off for a few minutes every day. It's not that you have to. It's you get to. It's not that you should. It's you can. I have this phrase, morning by morning, new verses I read. And it's true for me the older I get. I never saw that before. Cindy will come into my office. She has her devotions in another room and she'll come in. I, I was reading, our citizenship is in heaven, not on this earth. And I go, okay, preach woman. <laughs> and she told me what she learned that morning. Maturity is turning discipline into reflex. And those who've been around Dallas know that name, Fred Smith. Seven, comparison is a kiss of death to contentment. Comparison is the kiss of death to contentment. We're content until we see something new, something better than what I have. A friend builds a new home. They buy a new car. They get a new boat. 
They take a fancy trip, whatever it might be. I call it the bigger, better, newer, more syndrome. We're not just consumers. We're, it's consumerism. That's why you have to buy the next iPhone. I have a very old Samsung Android throwaway phone that works better than any of your new iPhones. And it was bought used for three or $400, and it still works. And I don't need anything there consumerism driving me for a $1,500, $2,000 phone with a monthly installment you could buy a small car. Bigger, better, new, more. Paul says in Philippians 4, 11, not that I speak from want, but I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Can you say that? I must move. Eight, ask God not merely for a miracle, but for an immovable faith, an immovable faith. Um, I've prayed over many people going into surgery. I've prayed over many people that have uh, terminal and operable cancer, and I've prayed the right prayers, and I pray, God, we know what the physicians have said. They've given the verdict, but you're God, and you're the great physician, and we ask you if it be, you'd be willing to do this. And I mean, the number of parents that, for all right reasons, tenaciously cling when their child has a cancer or some problem that, oh, please, please, please. I'm there. I've been there. But in my away moments, I think, would I rather have a miracle or an immovable faith? If I get a miracle, I'm going to need another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, because life is full of hard. But if I can face that thing with an immovable faith, that seems to me to be helpful. Maybe not for you, but it is for me. Nine, this life at best is a clean bus station. If you've never traveled on a bus, you have no idea what that means. (laughs) If you've been to a developing country, you understand what it means. Our idea of heaven is in need of repair. You may or may not like Randy Alcorn's view of heaven, but I believe he's the one that said, Heaven is the home you've never been to. But we, it's so, got to be here and now and make it work. And we're always looking at the bigger, better ministries and the bigger, better women, men, authors that we want to be like. Live well, be healthy, don't be obsessed with it. Ten, I must land the plane. Be the man or woman Christ wants you to be no matter what. Be the man or woman Christ wants you to be no matter what. No matter your circumstance, your victim, hurt, wound, what others do to you, the injustice. You will face the injustices that will come your way. Those who hear my teaching often know that I have this little saying, another cheery Michael Easley sermon. Your life's going to be hard. It's going to be disappointing. Friends are going to betray you. They're going to knife you in the back. They're going to lie about you. They're going to write things about you that may or may not be true that are going to hurt you deeply. I want to be the man, the woman Christ wants me to be no matter what. How do you stand when that happens? Many passages, but 2 Samuel 10, 12, be strong and show ourselves courageous. Psalm 31, be strong and take heart, take courage, on and on it goes. To me, that was a life changer, was that no matter what the situation and circumstances, the opinions of you would be as a leader, I salute one. When we lived in D.C., there was a, um, you might know it as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers, but the Tomb Guard Sentinels are the oldest standing order guard in America. It's a very prestigious thing to be part of this group. And if you've seen the, the, as they march back and forth in front of the, it's now called the Tomb of the Unknowns. And they do it pretty much 24-7, 365. There are some times they stand down, but pretty much if it's raining and snowing, that guard is out there in front of that tomb of the unknowns. Which, by the way, there's more than one person in there. There's several unidentified bodies in there. And this is the creed they memorize. And with this, I will close. My dedication to this sacred duty is total and wholehearted. In the responsibility bestowed on me, never will I falter. With dignity and perseverance, my standard will remain perfection. That's line six in the creed, and if you're a tomb guard, that's how they greet each other. Line six, line six, my standard will remain perfection. 
Through the years of diligence and praise and the discomfort of the elements, I will walk my tour in humble reverence to the best of my ability. It is he, the tomb, who commands the respect. I protect his bravery that made us so proud. Surrounded by well-meaning crowds by day, alone in the thoughtful peace of night. This soldier will in honored glory rest under my eternal vigilance. We've been there many times. We've seen it many times. It'll wreck your heart. It'll make you cry even if you don't like the country. And I remember reading that creed for the first time. And they are guarding a box of bones. You're guarding a trust. That's eternal. May God give you the courage without wavering, without wincing, without capitulating the culture to be the man or the woman God wants you to be. Father, thank you for these patient men and women. Encourage their hearts. Fill them with great courage and great joy as they serve a living king. You are alive. You are not dead. And may we understand what it means to be the faithful man or woman you have called us to be. In Christ's powerful name we pray.